Hi everyone, my name is Kingsley Madikeba, and um, we're presenting on infrastructure as a code, actually thinking beyond infrastructure as a code. And um, my, my name is, I'm a um, cloud consultant with um, um, Google GCP, Google Cloud. <laughs> and, uh, um, and I'm going to, um, I apologize, I don't know why I'm, uh, I'm, I'm shaking. <laughs> but yeah, I'm an application modernization consultant with Google Cloud. I help GCP customers modernize the application on GCP. And I'm presenting with Amol. And Amol, would you like to choose yourself? Yeah, sure. Thanks, Kingsley. Uh, I'm part of the application modernization team, and I'm a hybrid cloud architect at Google. We generally deal with customers who are dealing with a lot of infrastructure. And this is where we get to really see a lot of problems that they face on surface. And this is where we are going to talk about how we can solve some of the most common challenges that are there with infrastructure as code, how we can think beyond having something which is more of uh, an inference related approach wherein you can analyze the code that is there on the application side without having application developers to press upon uh, any of the uh, infrastructure configurations and, and how inferring from the application code you can have your infrastructure provisioned uh, on the fly. So this is where I will be talking about all of this in the next 30 minutes or so. Before we get to start, uh, there is a disclaimer. So the content and news presented here are personally uh, kind of uh, uh, presented. Uh, they should not be uh, uh, kind of uh, associated to Google or any of the organizations or professional bodies here associated with this. Okay? So I'll hand it over to Kingsley to go over the agenda. And then we'll uh, have some demonstrations as well for this particular paradigm. Yes. Okay, so I'm going to move a little bit closer so I can actually, we can both uh, see what's going on. So the, the uh, fourth agenda I'm, I'm going to cover today, one is we'll talk to uh, infrastructure as a code. What are the challenges of infrastructure as a code? Then we're talking to the new paradigm of infrastructure from code. And we will also like to give you guys some exposure to some of the uh, infrastructure from code tooling so you can kind of understand how the whole paradigm works. And um, at the end, we'll conclude with some of the best practice on how you can make the most of infrastructure as a code. So, and um, you might have hold the clicker. Thank you. Okay, cool. So, at the outcome of this uh, session, we want, want to leave you with knowledge to be able to evaluate when to use infrastructure from code versus when to use infrastructure. Um, infrastructure as a code or infrastructure from code. We also want to expose you with some open source tooling and help you decide if infrastructure from code or IFC is the right tool for your organization and also what to do when IFC is not sufficient for your organization. So I'm going to start out giving you a brief history of infrastructure as a code and um, we'll start from, you know, how that, how it evolved as the cloud cloud evolved. So, you know, back when a system was introduced, there was always some form of configuration for infrastructure as a code. So it's either um, was done manually and, you know, you had a more monolithic system where you, that requires a lot of downtime to be able to make upgrades and make changes. And somewhere between the early 90s, there was a new concept that kept, got introduced in, of configuration management and how that started it was to CF Engine, they're one of the pioneer. Um, and um, there's an individual named Mark Burgess. Anyone knows that name? Is that name familiar to anyone? Okay, there's one person that knows that name. Yeah, so he was a physics uh, student and uh, working in the University of, of Oslo. And he was working on a lot of like systems that, that he had to upgrade. And he realized that, you know what, there's a lot of systems has a lot of commonality. And so he wrote uh, a program to kind of like simplify the installation of like m multiple systems at the same time. And from there, that kind of evolved into what we call uh, CF Engine. And that's also an open source uh, tool. And, you know, and it, uh, I think it's under, uh, it's not part of the Linux financial license, but, I, I, but it's, it's open source. Um, so from that um, idea, there's a lot more newer pioneers into that idea of like updating system in a more scalable manner. Um, but one thing that like C, uh, CF engine is a need for a domain specific language in order to be able to um, 
update the system. So how that works is like you I looked at looked at all your uh, your d different systems, understand what is commonality, write a domain specific um, language to be able to kind of simplify those commonalities and uh, in a in a uh, repeatable manner. So Chef pioneered another tooling that was like mind blowing. Added a lot of cool features and made it a lot of uh, simpler for people to to use. Uh, so did Puppet. And in 20, 2006, there was a new uh, um, service that got introduced and um, EC2 engine by AWS. And this was kind of the, the rise of like cloud computing. So, and, and anyone, not, is anyone here not familiar with cloud computing? Because I'm trying to make it as basic as possible. Has anyone heard of AWS? <laughs> okay, yes, one person is heard of AWS. So, um, so they introduced this idea of like, um, you know, kind of like um, cloud computing and that, that way you don't need to rely on creating your own server and hosting your own, uh, own resources, right? That you have, um, you know, a service provider, manage your server, manage your, um, or your, your, your environment. And with that introduction, a newer set of tools got introduced on how to do it in a, in a more repeatable manner that doesn't require um, an individual running around holding cables and, 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 uh, and servers and, ma and making the switches because, it's, because it's, it's a cloud ser service, you can actually write API calls to make this, um, that process more repeatable. And as, we, as that evolved a little bit more, we had some more new tools, salt stack got introduced, and uh, Ansible. Um, and, um, and right after Ansible, then there was more a shift to a more microservices architecture and with Docker being one of this pioneer. And how Docker idea was like, you know, rather than creating new set of virtual machines, you know, how, why don't we create a more, bite-sized virtual machine that you can really um, um, use to kind of like host your application without managing a whole large set of dependencies. Again, I'm just simplifying the, the concept for everyone. Um, and, and that way you don't have to treat your virtual machines as a, a, a special resource. You can just use it when you need it and destroy it and create a new one. So the whole concept of Docker container kind of evolved with, with Docker. And with the rise of Docker, um, Kubernetes also got introduced uh, the following year in 2014. Um, it's not really on the slide, but in the same year Kubernetes got introduced, Terraform also got introduced. And, uh, and have anyone heard of Terraform? Okay, a lot more people have heard of Terraform. That's good, yes. So, so Terraform became one of the pioneers of like, you know, you don't really need to um, focus on like, you know, your domain specific um, your cloud native um, um, language in, in order to manage your infrastructure is like they use um, API across multiple cloud providers and given individuals to be able to do stuff like cloud agnostic um, infrastructure management. And um, with, with, with the rise of you know, Kubernetes that does the orchestration of your, of your uh, containers, um, more and more uh, services became more, more, more introduced. And, it's, and as you look through the, the slide from going from a monolithic legacy system and going closer and closer towards the microservices, serverless um, um, architecture, which is where the, we, 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 the way we're going in, in the changes in you know, the cloud computing services, also the, the management um, of those systems is evolving. And we've seen new tools like Pulumi the idea of like, you know, rather than relying on, um, you know, um, you to manage just your application, you actually have a more, uh, you, you could manage your, your environment using application code rather than writing a domain specific languages. And that's more involving and more involving. And, 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 but even with this whole history of the more, the, the more changes, there's still some more challenges with infrastructure code. Um, and um, I think if anyone's operating in the, in, in, uh, the cloud space, you realize that, you know, um, with more, more tool, there's, although there, there's more advancement, there's more changes, but there's also more challenges and, and more, more overhead to manage. And, and we'll talk a little bit about some of the challenges and maybe you can share your own insight on you, the challenges you're experiencing in your organization. 
So one is manual configurations. So in order for you, with, with infrastructure code, you kind of have to manually define your configurations, define the expected behavior. You also have to write a, 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 a separate uh, domain specific language, a DSL, to kind of like um, test your configuration to make sure it's, 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 it's uh, repeatable and it's also, um, and, um, and it's also um, uh, scalable and also meets your needs. Also, as a developer, uh, you also have to kind of increase your knowledge base. So it's not, not you might be a, you know, a Java developer, but being able to write a Terraform code is also, or uh, you have to kind of like learn um, Nitrix um, framework. Uh, I'm sorry, it's a Nitrix, I meant HashiCorp framework on how to write. Uh, <laughs> there's, a hash, there's a Nitrix guy in the, in the audience, but you have to learn HashiCorp's language to be able to write Terraform code. And that increases the complexity of, you know, your, the knowledge bits of how you have to, you know, learn a, a second language rather than writing something that's native to you. CI city complexity, so managing um, a, a, you know, separate sets of languages also increases the amount of l creating separate pipeline to be able to test those languages um, based on, you know, the, the best practices according to that particular framework you, uh, you're using. So which increases the uh, uh, dependencies, also dep increases more complexity because you have to work with, um, work with multiple uh, cross-functional teams within an organization. So what also adds is it also adds some lead time into your whole process because you have your DevOps team that has their own set of SLA that they have to manage. You have your application team that has their SLA to release code as quickly as possible. So they have, there's always this negotiation between your DevOps team and your, uh, and your application team on, uh, can I get an environment so I can, you know, deploy my code? And um, so that's, uh, we, we see that in a lot of organizations where you, you always have that tussle with, you know, um, with, your, with your, your platform team or even your network team in order to make a, a new change. So, tools fall. So a lot of tools create a lot more management overhead. So you have a different teams, as I mentioned earlier, skill sets in order to be able to um, manage your IT um, uh, infrastructure. Also, uh, some other challenges is kind of like, you know, provision and certainty. So you don't really know if you're provisioning the right amount of environment for your, to host your application. So you kind of have to um, either do some kind of mathematics to kind of like predict the amount of infrastructure you need uh, to use. Um, and, um, and sometimes you, you could under provision and again, there's more and more, uh, you know, as the cloud is evolving and you know, you have more managed services that kind of like helps you in that aspect, but still that negotiation also always needs to be done. So, um, so multi, <laughs> supporting multi, uh, multi cloud creates multi um, uh, <laughs> environment and overhead that you have to support. So you have to kind of determine, you know, what is it, understand not just um, on the domain specific language, also, also understand the multi cloud providers, the different cloud providers, um, specific API and structure that it needs to use. And, uh, and the last one is like, you know, solving for multi tenancy. Um, again, big, uh, another, another big challenge is, and, and it's also evolved based on different stack you, you choose. But but what if there was a, a, a better way of writing code? What if there's a better and simpler version of like releasing code as a developer, whether you're a Java developer, whether you're uh, a Python developer, but you don't really have to worry about all this complexity and overhead. And you know, I think that's what the whole idea of like serverless architecture was supposed to simplify. And um, I'm gonna transition it over to Amor just to talk to a new paradigm in, in, in developing application. And um, this is something that's kind of uh, creating a buzz within the open source community. And I just wanted to uh, thought we should kind of share that out to the community as well. Sure, yep, thanks Kingsley. So now we are going to focus on a paradigm which is relatively new in the market, but that is something which really lets you think beyond infrastructure as code. 
what we are talking about here is inferring your application code, analyzing it, and identifying what all infrastructure components would go into to host your application effectively, and that too at scale in a resilient and reliable manner. When we are talking about infrastructure from code paradigm, it is something which also resonates with something called as the self-provisioning runtime paradigm. Okay, so this is where you just have to focus on your applications. You really don't need to focus on any of the infrastructural components. You will be laser focused on developing your product, making it hit the market at the right time without really getting into delays of infrastructure getting provisioned first, then you going ahead and testing your application on top of that infrastructure, then further uh, going into cycles to tune your infrastructure to suit your application needs. This is where we get to understand infrastructure from code is a pattern which is better suited for serverless and event-driven architectures. You could be deploying your applications on some other infrastructure stack like virtual machines or Kubernetes as well, but then infrastructure from code is uh, designed to uh, basically provide you an abstraction from such kind of things wherein you really don't need to focus on how to tune your underlying platform. That is where, though you can write some custom providers which will enable you to host your applications on top of Kubernetes or any other, let's say, platforms, still serverless and event-driven applications are going to be the main focus of this particular paradigm. There are different approaches or categories as to how infrastructure from code could be realized. And broadly, we have categorized them into four. The first one is programming languages. So some companies, open source as well as proprietary have started to come up with new programming languages. So anyone has heard name of Winglang, Darklang. These are the programming languages which uh, build around the concept of infrastructure from code. And then they enable you to write applications in their programming language, wherein they can tweak and interpret what, what your application requirements are and uh, accordingly create your infrastructure. Then there is an SDK-based approach wherein you can pretty much use your existing application and on top of that, you can incorporate some new SDKs. These SDKs will be letting you create things like storage buckets, message queues, topics, or uh, let's say APIs. You could expose your applications on API gateways. This is what the SDK approach offers. Then there is an annotations-based approach wherein you could Again, reutilize your existing code base, but then there is some sort of dependency injection that you need to take care of. So either you will be decorating your functions, you will be putting annotations, or you will be defining the way in which the dependencies for all the infrastructure components should really be coming into play when you are having your applications deployed and the runtime dynamics are being described. And then there is a pure annotations approach wherein one step further we step and, and we go ahead into a place wherein there are annotations which are acting, but on top of that, during the intermediate code generation phase, there is some rewriting that happens to uh, tailor your code into something which could be better fit for running on infrastructure that you are aiming for. So these are the four paradigms that uh, currently exist within the IFC approach. And we are going to see a couple of examples here for Nitric, which is SDK-based approach. There are some other open source projects as well, like Clotho, which is a pure uh, annotation-based, uh, uh, let's say, uh, which follows a pure annotation-based approach. There is another called Bing Lang, as I mentioned. It's an, another open source programming language. There are some other proprietary ones as well. So Shuttle and Core, AMP, uh, you can probably go ahead and check them out on, on the internet. So this is where, uh, without uh, further getting uh, let's say into too much of theory, uh, we'll be getting some, some sort of practical exposure and this is going to be with Nitric. So what I have done is as part of your shared application uh, that, that you would have received, there should be a QR code uh, that, that uh, should be having a link to this particular repository. This is a public Git repository uh, that, that we have hosted. This particularly has an application which is going to do an OCR image detection. So you are going to image, uh, upload an image. That image probably could be having some text. What this application would be doing is this will be exposing a bunch of APIs. These APIs are going to be further exposed via API gateway. But 
what you will be focusing on is just the application code. You don't need to worry about how API Gateway is going to come into picture, how this application itself is going to get hosted. Nothing of that sort is what you have to delve into. So you will be focusing on just purely writing your APIs and nothing else. So this is the code base. Uh, this is a Python-based application. And uh, though this particular uh, example is going to have the application deployed on Google Cloud Provider uh, platform, and it is going to use Google Cloud Vision API in order to have the OCR image text detection done. But you are free to deploy this application on AWS, on Azure, or any other supported cloud providers. The way infrastructure from code paradigm works is you build your application in an agnostic fashion. And really, you can deploy the same application by just providing something called as a stack configuration, wherein you can say that, OK, I want to bring my application in the AWS stack. And it will automatically, let's say, bring up S3 in AWS if you are dealing with storage buckets. If it's GCP on which your application is hosted because of uh, you choosing the GCP stack, it will be bringing up the Google Cloud storage buckets. You don't have to define whether one should go ahead and choose S3 or whether one should go ahead and choose GCS. It's something that is automatically getting interpreted because of this IFC SDK-based approach. So you just focus on writing your APIs, routes, functions, nothing else. You don't really need to be even aware of what the name of uh, service or cloud platform provider service is uh, for, for the target platform. How this repository has been organized is that there is a services directory. And this services directory has a Python application in it, which we'll go through <coughs> shortly. There is something uh, in the bottom uh, that, that you see. At the bottom, there is a Nitric YAML. That is uh, some configuration of metadata related to Nitric version, the client version, etc. Then there is Nitric GCP mock. This is something which is defining to which project in GCP we need to deploy our application. That's just the identifier for the project wherein we are going to host. For the people who are not aware, GCP projects are just uh, your container for the resources. When I say container, it's not Kubernetes container, but this is just a bounded box wherein you will be able to deploy your cloud services on GCP. And then there is something called as pip file, just in order to have the dependency management done the right way. Okay. So uh, this particular repository has uh, good readme documentation, step-by-step uh, -step usage guide is also there. And also some of the examples that we have here have been published at the Nitrix uh, open source Git repository as well. So you could access any of them. Uh, coming to the services, this is the Python application that we are talking about. Again, this has uh, good comments and details, annotations, type hints, et cetera in order for you to really follow this example in a very good fashion. What we are focused on is this particular uh, stanza, which is uh, dealing with the SDK imports. Is, is this visible at the back? OK. So SDK imports are essentially letting us know that we want to introduce <clears throat> nitric resources like APIs, buckets, key value stores. OK. Now, in Bucket, as I mentioned, if, if it's AWS, it will be automatically interpreted as S3. If it's GCP, it will be interpreted as GCS. Key value store, likewise, in GCP, it will be Firestore. Whatever equivalent is there in AWS or Azure would be taken into account automatically. We define the API. Uh, API is now uh, there to initialize the Nitric SDK's way of, of uh, uh, API initialization. This API, what it is going to do is this is going to have <clears throat> this is going to have uh, an API gateway created. Okay, this particular API gateway resource is going to expose your set of applications and the routes that you are going to uh, have. Likewise, we have initialization of key value store. So this is just the Nitric SDK way of initializing a key value store. And then in the background, it will be getting translated into whether it, whether this is a GCS, uh, a, a GCP specific key value store like Firestore or some AWS specific or any other provider which is supported. Likewise for the buckets. And the beauty of the solution is that it comes with some standardization at hand. It already has followed some leading practices. Uh, uh, from the industry to have uh, hardening done. So the things that you see on line 73, uh, after bucket, there is uh, another function allow, which has reading, writing. Then there is on line 64, 
dot allow get set these are the iam permissions so we are telling that our application should be getting get set permissions on key value store via 64 uh, via what what we have defined at line 64 likewise whatever we have on line 73 is telling that our application should be having reading writing access to the storage bucket on the cloud provider of the choice okay and this is where uh, rest of the stuff is pretty much around uh, the user journeys that we have defined so with this application what we are intending to do is we are going to have four critical user journeys again these these are just for demonstration purposes the first user journey is that you should be able to create your profile okay so that is just a simple post call over a route that you have exposed for your application the second user journey is you should be able to retrieve the profile metadata you should be able to know okay if i'm passing some specific object id or uuid i should be getting the metadata corresponding to that particular profile user journey 3 is you should be able to upload an image which should get stored in the object storage for the cloud provider of your choice and this particular application if you have multiple stacks maintained for disaster recovery purposes if you are maintaining one data center in gcp one in aws one in azure you could have three stacks one focus on gcp one focus on aws one focus on azure the same application code regardless of the cloud platform will be working and then you can have all the load balancing routing whatever you have to do as as a thing outside this particular layer and we'll come to that uh, why that is required so user journey number three is you should be able to upload an image against which you want to run the ocr detection and this is where uh, we'll be using a signed url pattern again which is part of the nitric middleware itself so nitric comes with middleware services like you can have course you can have authentication authorization you can have signed url stuff so a lot of things are present already in the middleware that that nitric has implemented and then the user uh, journey number four is as and when you are having the image upload done there is an event notification trigger that gets triggered and it triggers the cloud vision api in the background which goes ahead and detects the text that is there in the image and then updates the user's metadata uh, the profile metadata so that you can see what text was there corresponding to the image so uh, let's quickly see how the uh, routes have been implemented so this is the route corresponding to the first user journey wherein we just had to annotate ocr api was the uh, uh, initialization object that we created for the api gateway resource uh, through the nitric sdk and then we are defining that it is a post uh, uh, http method that we are focused on and the path matcher should be profiles and then there is an http context which is going to carry the request response payload context for the http call yeah this is where it's pretty straightforward uh, we are using a uuid generator uh, to to generate uh, an id we have some checks done for the keys that we are expecting as part of our json payload and then we are checking whether json is is there or not so it's, it's pretty much a check of whether the payload is right or not just so that you can you can feel that this application is a real application here yeah? for demonstration purposes and likewise error handling has been done but we'll come to the actual logic so since this is a framework which is dealing with a lot of apis which could be even running for longer duration your operations could be long running and that's where you have to use some async patterns so generally when dealing with nitric you would be using await okay this is something which is specific to the python implementation likewise you could have your own async related patterns followed for node.js golang whatever languages are supported by nitric so there are experiments on jvm dart etc also going on node.js and python are already there uh, there are uh, version one released and, and they are running stable but some of them are experimental like dart and and the team is building that so this is where you see that we are having a set operation done in an async fashion where we are having the payload taken and then we are uploading the payload likewise uh, we will be dealing with other objects like buckets apis etc uh, and, and those will be done in an async manner the next user journey is represented through the ocr api get flow this is where we are providing the uh, uh, we, we are providing an identifier so we are telling this id can be anything which the user is passing so this is just a way of telling that this is a placeholder wherein the user would be supplying some 
query parameter, let's say, or would be supplying some path. So that is something which is configurable based on the APS that you want to use. Here we are defining a path, but you can play on the HTTP payload, whether it could be a form field, it could be a query parameter, it could be a JSON payload. Here we are specifically talking about path matcher pattern. So this is where you essentially have the await call again called to get the details of the user's metadata. Likewise, we have a get call to get the uh, signed URL for the uh, user ID. And this is where for signed URL, we are dealing with buckets. So this is an implementation of the middleware itself, wherein we can essentially generate a signed URL for a specific, let's say, bucket path. And then we can have the expiry date, etc. all the attributes that are relevant to a signed URL uh, specified here. Based on that, uh, we are just creating a URL which will be giving one hour's, let's say, limit or, or time to the, to the end user to upload their image. If they are not able to upload the image, the, the URL will expire. So that's just a functionality, again, like nothing to do with the paradigm itself, but just the, the user journey that we are defining so that we, we can understand how the application is working. The last one is the notification trigger. As in when you are having your signed URL used to upload an image to the bucket, the image will land in the bucket and then will trigger a notification which will be powered by some sort of asynchronous communication or it could be using a pub sub pattern for the triggers in the background as well. This is where there is a trigger uh, occurring wherein you are now taking the image from the bucket, having its uh, attributes checked and then on top of that you are uh, having the Google Cloud Vision API triggered. Now, this is where we are having all the text detection related API calls being made. This particular code that I'm highlighting here could be replaced by any other vendor of your choice. So you could be using the OCR APIs of any other party as well. For this particular demonstration, I'm using for Google, but you could be using, so it's, it's, a, it's a very pluggable or flexible solution basically. Uh, and yeah, you just start the Nitric application. So this is how the application looks like. And in order to really work with this particular application, uh, what we'll be doing is uh, we'll be having uh, a live demonstration scene. So this is my directory. This is where Nitric has a local simulator as well that can be started by having the command Nitric start. What this will do is this will open a simulation area and will also open a browser window for you so that you can have an easy UI experience. Now with the UI experience, you will be able to see all the resources related to APIs, gateways, buckets, key, key value pairs, etc. cetera, scene. Uh, I think I had double window, so let me start again. My port was conflicting. Now it should appear. So this is where this, this particular UI is going to load and this is going to give you a good understanding of how your APIs are exposed. Along with APIs, you are going to even have uh, things like architecture diagrams created for you so that you can see uh, how the information is, is propagating, how the APIs are really exposed. So I just cleared my port usage just to avoid any conflicting ports and we should be up. Okay, let's wait for it. So far, any questions? Yeah? Yeah? How does this approach differ from Pulumi? Yeah, so Pulumi is essentially more oriented uh, towards a CDK approach wherein you are using programming languages to define the infrastructure. Your application code is still something which is different, but you can use Pulumi automation APIs to embed your application code or embed your infrastructure code that you have written in Pulumi within your application. So this, this is the difference between both of these. Here you are not really focusing on any app, uh, infrastructure code. Instead, uh, you are just writing your application and you are going about having uh, the infrastructure interpreted and then inferred and, and it automatically gets deployed. So now, okay, the port is good. So uh, we have the application up and running. There was some port conflict out there. So you see that I'll first show you how the dashboard looks like. So we have three APIs, the post API, the get API, and the signed URL pattern API. The profile API is where we will be providing a body. So let's provide a body uh, like, and, and I know the keys that I have to supply, so I'll write my own name. 
then we will have age that is another JSON field that we need to pass let's say 28 and then we have city and then I send it now as in when I send it I will be having a profile ID generated this is the UUID that I was implementing now using this UUID I'll have my other get call I should be seeing the details of my payload that I have passed so if I send it out, I'll be getting an HTTP response with all my details. Now, our task is we will be next generating a signed URL against which we'll be uploading an image. This particular metadata that we are getting should be having a new field added on top of it. This is so far a local simulation, but we will see that in the cloud as well. Okay. So now the next thing is uh, we'll just copy this uh, profile ID that uh, we received. And we'll go about having the key supplied here so now this is where we have profile profile id image upload and this is a get call this is just to get the signed url okay so now we received the signed url here what we are going to do is we are going to have our command demo uh, such thing this is something that i just created so that it's handy and i can trigger curl commands on the fly i'll be exposing the signed url okay and uh, let me take it and I'll be hitting this. So let's wait for my terminal to start. Okay. Okay, so I have exposed my signed URL. And now what I'm going to do is I'm going to upload one of the images with code. So I, what I have is I have a folder created in which I have a bunch of images which have some text. Uh, these are some quotes from some scientists. What we are going to do is we are going to have the text detected from these images. And uh, this is the API that we are going to hit. So let's go to our commands demo. Okay. So let me see. Okay. I'm not in the main directory. Let me move. Okay. So I have a 200 response here. Now with the 200 response, I should have got the notification trigger related uh, event uh, already processed. So now when I go ahead and hit my uh, profile uh, specific uh, metadata API, I should essentially be getting some text and this text reads out no amount of experimentation, whatever the code was written on the image. So this is what we have done a local simulation. So now you imagine you really don't need to use anything like tilt. You don't need to use something like draft scaffold. You are just building your application in a container native manner. The containerization efforts are gone. You really are not uh, building any Docker files. If you want to do any Docker file customization or if you are using Podman or any other engine for containers, you could have the specifications overridden through some Nitric YAML configurations. So we just focus on the application. We really did not touch any container code. We really did not touch any infrastructure stuff. And still, all the application local development experience is also something which in a seamless manner you were, you were able to uh, uh, exercise. So now what we'll do is we'll go ahead and we'll have nitric up done. Now when we do nitric up, we essentially can provide the stack name. So what I have done is in interest of time, I have already gone ahead and created a stack of mine, which is called the GCP OCR application stack. Under this particular stack, I have a UAT deployment, uh, which I'll be showing you. So this is the GCP UAT uh, application. This particular application, if you see the updates, what happens when you do a nitric up is that it triggers Pulumi in the background. So this is where now your application code is getting inferred. Your application code related resources are getting inferred and they start getting created. So this is what is happening in the background. Now Pulumi is going ahead and creating the infrastructure for you on GCP. And then you are getting exposed with one uh, uh, resource, which is essentially your output resource, which is the endpoint, API endpoint. So now this particular API endpoint is my GCP API gateway endpoint. Likewise, I have my buckets in GCP, I have my key value store in GCP, I have my service accounts in GCP, and I have all the related resources that should have been there in GCP. And these are like 50, 52 resources, uh, if, if we go ahead and check, and if you, 62 resources, okay, not 52. And you can see the dependency of them in Pulumi dashboard in a very nice manner like this. 
So the page size is big, but you can see that you, you have which resources then further creating, which resources and de dependency of, of all of them are really very visible to you. So this is where Nitric is in the background using Pulumi as of now, but it's configurable. You will be able to use Terraform or other IAC uh, counterparts as well as needed based on the based on the requirements. So this is where we'll just quickly go to our GCP console to see the resources. And likewise, you can go ahead and hit these APIs that I showed on the API gateway. So I'll just quickly show you that as well while the GCP console is loading. This is, uh, uh, let me see the application deployment stack quickly once. Where did I deploy and which project did I deploy? Okay, this is the project I need to change to. Okay. So if I do a cloud run, so now Cloud Run has been created for me in the background. My container images, artifactory, management of everything in a, in a very secure fashion has already been created. I did not really have to go ahead and have any RBAC, IAM assignments done. All of that was taken care by uh, Nitric. And this is where standardization comes into picture. You really don't need to get into hassle of defining different standards that should be used. It could be that if you are in a multi-tenant or multi-business unit ecosystem, there are different people who are, or different teams who are wanting different side of uh, uh, types of uh, resources. And, and this is where uh, all of this is taken care of in, in a coded fashion. Now, uh, you have the Cloud Run API already running. And this is where uh, we can just go ahead and have the uh, commands as shown in this particular thing uh, and, and use the OCR gateway API related uh, URL. Yeah. So with this, uh, since we are nearing the time, we are going to go ahead and have the key takeaways taken. And these are the 10 key takeaways from this particular talk. So with Nitric or with any other IFC paradigm related framework, you will be getting speed to market. You will essentially be able to prototype your applications very really quickly and will be a rapid development experience for you. You will be able to focus on the product and application rather than getting into the issues of infrastructure related uh, stuff and, and the configuration or, or the tool proliferation. You will be having baked in infrastructure standardization and then there will be some performance improvements in terms of delivery or, or the overall life cycle. There will be reduced configuration drift because now you are going to just focus on application related CI CD instead of handling infrastructure CI CD and application CI CD as two different sets. Yeah. Then you will be having a lot of, uh, let's say, uh, good quality serverless uh, related development done, which, which means you will be getting faster to mar market again. So it's, it's just a side effect. You'll be having good. Uh, convenient, let's say, development experiences for digital natives or, or teams which are small enough. For enterprises, certainly there will be some more requirements wherein serverless patterns may or may not be appropriate, wherein you may have to extend this IFC pattern along with IAC pattern. So this is where IFC is not a replacement for IAC. It's a complementing paradigm, okay? And you have to uh, just focus on your code. All the multi-vendor or multi-platform related dependencies are going to get uh, into consideration on its own. So, yeah, it's a still uh, evolving paradigm. You are having different categories to choose from, but then certainly since it's the age of uh, AI, uh, there could be some AI related, uh, let's say advancements also happening in this uh, IFC field, wherein you could be able to have some AI related generations done for your infrastructure. Uh, however, you need some degree of determinism or uh, you, you need deterministic nature in which you really cannot afford to have all the decisions uh, left for the AI to take for you. This is where such kind of SDK based approaches are going to be the main focus areas, which could further be complemented with AI. Uh, and this is where you will be having uh, less control over full fledged infrastructure. So if there are any components outside let's say serverless or even driven architectures, you may have to have some pre-steps run in your pipeline to bring up those components or probably have some pre and post scripts also deployed. And it could be that if you are in serverless, it's, it's still okay because in the stack you can configure, okay, how much cloud run should be taking from heap perspective when booting up, et cetera. But then if you are really hitting any event like Cyber Monday or Black Friday, pre-warming of infrastructure could be a concern and there could be some practices that you may have to develop. So with this, 
Uh, I would just say that it's, it's still evolving, but it's something that you should, uh, certainly should be having a look at. And uh, yeah, these are the resources. You can scan the IFC resources, the OCI demo application related code base uh, along with instructions and usage guide is also present here. And uh, we are up here for questions. Uh, we have already crossed like three, four minutes, uh, the scheduled time. And this, these are our coordinates. If you really want to follow us or have a chat with us regarding any uh, stuff beyond IFC as well, uh, we are into application modernization stuff, can really guide you on uh, emerging technologies and patterns. Feel free to get connected with us and we'll be happy to chat. So yeah, thanks a lot for being patient audience. And uh, we do have uh, Steve as well from the Nitric team who is present. So if anyone has really very specific questions from, Nit uh, from Nitric perspective, feel free to reach out to the Nitric team. And we are here uh, for next 10 to 15 minutes if you want to have a one-on-one -on -one chat or if anyone has any questions. Yeah, thanks. Cool, thanks a lot. This is the uh, implementation uh, behavior of Nitric. So Nitric, uh, as, as a framework itself, has been built on top of async programming paradigm. And yeah. So you're not passing that through native Python. You're passing it through. There are wrappers, yeah. Yep, yeah, yeah. yeah. One more. If you go to your first slide on the history. OK. Yeah, OK. Let me quickly see if I can jump. I'll, I'll do like this only. <laughs> yep. Uh, I would add background. Yeah, yeah, certainly, certainly. Yeah, so yeah. That, that, that's that would, a very good, yeah. yeah. That will probably be early on, like one of his hard to copy early yeah. products. So, so, so the thing is like, it, it first started with some decentralized systems wherein people thought that, okay, they, they want to go on the lines of having some sort of promise theory related concepts exercised, wherein you would be having some agents running and then they will be connecting with some hubs. The agents will be really uh, having understanding of the desired state and they will be trying to maintain the desired state somewhat a reconciliation pattern. That is what CF Engine used to do. Then certainly Vagrant and, and all uh, other configuration management tools came into picture. But until Terraform came, uh, tools were mostly on the lines of probably you are doing some SSH into machines and then configuring or you are doing some rsync or, or some other utilities or CLIs you are using to go ahead, get into the machine and configure them. With Terraform and starting there on, you, would, you, you essentially had the exposure of driving it through an API driven pattern. And this is where like, we did not really stress on cross-plane because that is something which is still IAC but different. It's a universal control plane for your APIs which you want to deploy. Uh, when I say APIs, these are not the APIs which, which are your proxy APIs or your middleware or your route APIs. This is, this is where you can essentially have custom resource definitions created for any of the providers based on which you will be having custom resources created and deployed in Kubernetes like any other deployment. And then there will be reconciliation logic as well. So if you have deployed an S3 bucket or GCS bucket through crossplane, you would be having the reconciliation logic of crossplane working and checking whether the state defined in Kubernetes, which is acting like a universal control plane, is matching the state that is there on the GCP side. So such is the thing, again, like, IFC, IAC, these both are complementing things. It could be, I'm not pretty sure, IFC could be picking and having some affinity with cross-plane related universal control plane approach as well. But so far, I have not heard of any tool that is exercising that. Generally, what is popular is you rely on something like Pulumi or Terraform for SDK-based approaches, or you write your own annotation engines, which further transpile or probably use some CDKs as well. So Terraform also now doesn't really have just the domain-specific language. It has something which is called CDK-TF. So now you can write programming language, uh, you can write your Terraform code in programming languages as well, which not many people know. That happened after Pulumi took this, uh, let's say, uh, space wherein programming language related IA IAC w uh, became popular. So yeah, uh, like d there are many tools out there and uh, uh, certainly like uh, all of them have something distinct and this is where 
needs to need basis, uh, uh, the usage also differs. But uh, many of the tools are complementing tools. I, I personally have even seen Terraform and Ansible used quite a lot in conjunction along with Helm charts. So it's, it's pretty uh, kind of common. Yeah. Yeah, so, so any applications which would be uh, requiring function as a service, let's say, so if you were to have anything on the lines of lambdas written, you, you probably could just focus on writing the code for lambdas and then you, you let the IFC uh, tool manage it, okay? Or probably like it, it depends. So I'm talking from an, from an SDK based or annotation based approach, but if you were to be in dark lang or wing lang, dark lang is something which is not open source, yet what they do is, they have, based on their programming language, the infrastructure interpreted and they deploy on their own infrastructure. So Darklang also provides infrastructure for deploying your application. So it, it really depends on the nature of tool and the kind of capabilities that they are providing. And open source tools like Winglang also do something similar to Darklang, but then they don't have their hosting platform or infrastructure. So. Yeah, so I, I, I would say you should uh, strategize that. It, it's not a replacement for IAC, okay? It's something that is complementing. It could be that you, f you go ahead and first help your manager understand the pain points that are there associated with IAC and the kind of velocity that you can bring by adapting to IFC pattern. This is where you could do some POCs and come up with applications and tell that, okay, your time to development and time to go to market was, let's say, one week only because you just focus on application code and writing pure, let's say, solid application rather than focusing on how the DevOps cycle would be looking like, how the dependencies would be taken care of. You did not have to reach out to, let's say, by the time you are going ahead and presenting this to your manager, you did not have to go and talk with platform teams. Moreover, the platform teams really did not have to know about your applications. So it's a two-way street, right? It's not just about applications, uh, application developers or developer experience getting uh, refined. It's also about the, the platform uh, team members or, or site reliability engineers, DevOps engineer, infrastructure system administrator, whatever personas are there which generally deal with infrastructure. They also don't really need to be aware of the application from deployment perspective. However, I would just keep out SRE from, from this because they really need to know about the reliability aspects of an application. So they need to be aware of the application code base, but I would just categorize this as platform or, or infrastructure administrators who really deal with infrastructure as code stuff. How, so can you repeat? Okay, yeah, sure. So, so platform engineering is essentially wherein, uh, like what, what Steve answered to, to some extent, uh, this is where the platform engineering team will be really laying down uh, company specific or, or, or organization specific guardrails. They will be laying down the practices. They will be telling, okay, if I'm having, let's say allow uh, permissions with set and get, those are going to go not with predefined IAM, which could be too permissive, but some restricted custom roles, which could be really very strict in nature. Likewise, there could be some other things that you may want to enforce as part of your standardization and governance journeys. This is where the platform engineering team will be writing something called as custom providers on top of uh, uh, Nitrake or, or any other platform. This is where they will need to code in Golang or, or whatever the uh, provider has been written in, but it's extensible and that, that's why it's good. So there are already uh, tested, vetted 
um, let's say, uh, patterns available for different providers, you have to go ahead and tweak it according to your governance standards.